Hi everyone, and welcome to Inside the Mix, co-hosted by the Recording Academy Producers and Engineers Wing and Dolby. I'm Maureen Droney with the Producers and Engineers Wing, and this is episode four of this ongoing series of conversations on immersive audio. Today, our topic is Dolby Atmos formats. We're live today, and all of you watching were specially invited, so please feel free to put any questions you have in the Zoom Q&A function. Now, ultimately, all of these Inside the Mix episodes will be posted online, and we'll let you know when and where that happens. Our special guest today is Mike Ward, who is Director of Architecture at Dolby Labs. Mike leads a global team of system architects who are responsible for defining and maintaining end-to-end -end ecosystems for the delivery of content created in Dolby. And a key part of his role is oversight of the growing and, as we know, evolving Dolby Atmos music ecosystem, including the audio formats used to deliver content to consumers across a wide variety of playback devices. Mike has been with Dolby since 1999, so he knows a lot and we're thrilled to have him with us today. Our stalwart moderator, once again, is engineer and multiple Grammy winner, Michael Romanowski, otherwise known as Romo, who is the owner of the San Francisco Bay Area's Coast Mastering. So we're going to spend about 35 minutes on the presentation, and then we've got another 25 minutes reserved for Q&A. So please make sure to use this opportunity to ask your questions. We're all learning here, and there's a lot to know. So now here is Christine Thomas, Dolby's Head of Music Partnerships, to get us rolling. Welcome back, Christine. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks again to the Recording Academy and to the P&E Wing, to you personally, Maureen, and to Michael for, for having us and, and working with us on this series. Um, we're thrilled to be here. I will just again remind you all, please, to use the Q&A opportunity. We really do our best to get to all of your questions. And with that, I'll ask Romo and Mike to join and mute my video. Hey, Christine, thank you so much. Thanks, Maureen, thanks, Christine. Thanks, Dolby, thanks, P&E Wing. And Michael, Mike, Michael, Mike, thanks, Mike. Really appreciate you being here and thanks for uh, having a conversation with us. Let's uh, let's just jump right in. Let's talk about formats. All right, very good. Welcome aboard. So, thank you, well, thanks everyone. Um, great to be here and uh, let's, uh, let's, yeah, talk about Dolby Atmos formats. All right, let's see if, Screen share works, so it does. And okay. All right, very good. I assume everyone can see that. So um, I will get started. So as mentioned, we're gonna to talk today about delivery of Dolby Atmos music um, to consumers and the formats that we use to do so and some of the details around those formats. Um, some of the questions uh, and topics we're gonna to cover where can Dolby Atmos music be heard and in which format? Um, how Dolby Atmos uh, is coded? Is it lossy coding? Uh, is that true or false? Sampling limitations? And we'll get into all sorts of other topics, I'm sure. All right, so what I wanted to do is to sort of present an overview of the Dolby Atmos music workflows and formats that we have today in place um, from end to end. And then we'll get into more details into the delivery and playback in each case and the formats that we use and how those are different um, uh, for each of the use cases that we support. So starting off, this is the sort of overall high level end to end workflow of Adobe Atmos Music. So we're starting on the left with content creation um, and using you know, digital audio workstations with either integrated Adobe Atmos rendering or together with the Adobe Atmos render app. Um, producing the master file, and then we get into the uh, the delivery piece. And that consists of the content encoding, um, using a variety of different encoding solutions. The delivery, um, which primarily for Dolby Atmos Music, I think in the market right now is, um, you know, via the internet, um, streaming or download, but we also do support physical media with this format. So Blu-ray disc is included, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then onto the different playback devices um, and the formats we use there and um, how all those connected. Overall, the philosophy we have on uh, the formats we use for Dolby Atmos Music is, is pretty simple. Um, really, our goal is transparent delivery. Ideally, we would do this. 
we would go straight from content creation directly to all those devices. And, you know, that would be technically possible to do. Because of the limitations, constraints of uh, the delivery media that we use to get to consumers, we need to be a little bit um, sophisticated into how we deliver that audio and the formats that we use in those use cases that we support. All right. So now I'm going to zoom in a little bit onto the delivery and playback pieces. So the different devices that we support um, and the endpoints that we support at the moment. And this is you know, a growing list um, and the different formats that we use to address those device types. And then we can talk in, talk in detail about why we have different formats or different use cases. So the first one um, we're going to talk about is actually the newest format. Uh, this is the Dolby AC4 format, the AC4 IMS format, um, and we use this for delivery to Android mobile devices, and it's also used for uh, delivery to music apps on iOS um, that are integrating, they did actually integrate the decoder into the app. Hey, Mike, delivery. Yeah, go quick, ahead. Uh, can you talk about what is, uh, what is new about the AC4 and why it was IMS? Uh, in this format, sure. This new. So, so yeah. So, AC4 is our sort of latest generation of of audio coding technology. Uh, it's quite a broad suite of technology, and it combines, um, I, I would say, the sort of the best of the, the coding expertise that we have um, from across Dolby into a single coding technology platform. Uh, what we've done with the the IMS variants. Uh, is to look at the problem of delivering high quality audio to mobile devices and balancing bit rate and quality as well as device decoding complexity um, so that we can deliver a very efficient bit stream to those devices and um, not sort of overload them with bit rate or again, you know, things like complexity, battery consumption become very important there. So the goal around AC4 IMS is, um, you know, highest quality at the lowest bit rate so that we can deliver a high quality solution across the highly variable mobile networks that we all encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there a device awareness in that that it knows then what you know when when it's hitting a particular device that it can a device it can handle either like you said this bit stream, you know, this file format, etc. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the <laughs> one of the nice things about delivery via you know the internet is that the the content delivery model is sort of inverted from what we've traditionally used in things like physical media and broadcast. In a typical music or indeed media playback application on a, on a connected device, it's the player that is making the decision on which stream to pick. And it does so based on knowledge of what the device is capable of. Um, so it will check the device to figure out what format is supported. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other you know, logic that goes into that decision as well. Um, network bandwidth is a key consideration. Uh, the actual connected endpoint of the device, my own headphones, speakers, some other connection, um, all of those go into the player logic to you know, pick the best stream for the playback situation and the network conditions that are available. You know, that's a, something that doesn't get talked about very much, but that's a, actually really a fundamental shift in the way music is distributed. It is not controlled down and distributed, you know, maybe hub spoke type, but it's dependent on, you know, it, here it comes and the user gets more, for one, decision making capabilities, but variety of options because of device, not necessarily because of what was sent in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and one of the other, uh, things that allows us to do, um, and we particularly found this important in, in the music space, is, uh, you know, traditionally in, you know, broadcast physical media, you would send the, the multi-channel uh, audio, and then you may need to downmix when you are sending to a device that doesn't have multi-channel or immersive capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, what we've done with Dolby Atmos Music is, you know, really tried to avoid that. There is a artistic stereo or other mix that is available. And if you're in a listening environment where that is the mix that should be heard and or that's your preference, then the player, that's where you can configure that yeah. and get that experience delivered. Yeah, that's then that's why this is uh, it's it's hugely important that we continue it as professionals, these types of seminars, but also for the public to educate everybody as how, you know, where the choices lie and what they're listening to, how they're listening to it, et cetera. So thank you yeah. for that. Let's let's keep going. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, and we'll talk in more details about, as I say, some of the some of the the configuration parameters that these formats support um, a little later on. So next up, and this is the um, uh, this next form I'm going to talk about is sort of the backbone of uh, well, Dolby Atmos to the home in general, but is also a very key part of the the music delivery piece. Um, is the format called uh, DD Plus Jock? Wow, what a catchy name! Um, so that's our sort of abbreviated technology name for uh, the Dolby Digital Plus codec um, with Dolby Atmos support. Uh, what this format does is um, you know, deliver objects directly to the playback device. Um, compared to the AC4 format, it does require higher bit rates, higher decoding complexity, things like that. But it is um, intended to scale to uh, multi-channel you know, playback environments. Uh, so. Um, this allows us to send objects and then to scale those objects to, um, you know, to whatever playback environment you're on, whether that's, you know, a full multi-channel loudspeaker system in a home, if you're lucky enough to have one, uh, you know, down to a smart speaker that will do, you know, virtualization from that, from that source. Can you uh, maybe mention the uh, resolution difference between the two? Um, somewhat difficult to, to make that comparison directly, I guess, because of the way that the coding works. Uh, so in the case of the AC4 IMS format, what we're doing in that format is uh, sort of a partial, I think the word I would use is a pre-render. Um, it is not the same as pre-rendered binaural because you're not baking the binaural signal into the IMS bitstream. Um, it's a layered stream that um, allows us to send um, audio to, the, to a device because we know it's a stereo device. And if you have headphones and you get Binaural output. If you have on-device stereo speakers, you get a virtualized stereo experience. Um, if you flip your phone into portrait mode and you're on the speakers, then it will fall back to a mono um, component, which is all built into the bitstream. Uh, the DD Plus Jock format is uh, actually carrying discrete objects to the consumer device um, because that, for that technology, we don't, you know, we don't actually know what the endpoint is with respect to its capabilities um, because we can send this to. As I say, smart speakers, home theaters, cars, sound bars, TVs, all these different endpoints. Cool, great. Um, right. Oh, I had some other question. I saw the, saw the question in the chat and then totally lost my question for you. Car uh, carry on, I'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah, very good. Okay. And as I say, I'll get into more details as to some of the parameters we have. Um, so last but not least, um, we also have uh, Blue Radius support. Um, using the Dolby 2HD format. Uh, this uh, is, um, you know, allows us to deliver uh, lossless compressed audio from the Blu ray disc format um, through to, again, home theater, TVs, whatever, pretty much with an HDMI input that has a Dolby Atmos decoder in it um, for, you know, for that delivery option. Cool. Actually, I remember what my question was, was virtualized stereo. I was going to ask you about that, but I think you're going to talk about that in a minute, the different, what that is as you come up to it. So, yeah, sure. sure. All right. So in quick summary in sort of written form. So the AC4 format, we're using streaming to Android mobile devices and iOS music apps. Um, and that's for uh, wired and Bluetooth headphone playback, as well as on device stereo speaker playback. Um, as mentioned, uh, the bitstream with, with IMS is, is layered. Um, what we're doing sort of under the hood is separating the, uh, the virtualized signal into separate component parts. So that allows us to do some smarts on the playback device based on how your device is configured. Um, we process the HRTF, the anechoic part of the uh, binaural headphone renders separately from the room model, which gives you that sense of space. Um, so that means that because we're sending those separately on the playback device, when you're on headphones, you get both of those signal components decoded and played back. When you're on um, stereo speakers on the device, then you get the anechoic HRTF, and then you apply a crosstalk canceller, and you get a you know a very good, quite compelling, uh, you know, virtualized immersive speaker experience from your stereo device. Okay, DD plus Jock. Um, so this one is used, as I say, that's, I, I would say DD plus Jock is the majority of the usage. You know, it, it goes to the most endpoints, the biggest variety of endpoints. Um, it's also used when streaming to the uh, Apple platforms, the Apple devices for the spatial audio headphone playback. So if you're listening on a spatial audio pair of headphones like these, then the DD plus Jock format is what's used to stream to the device. 
The reason for that is that um, the Apple devices, one of the you know one of the big features there is head tracking, and to achieve head tracking, you need all those objects to be in the playback device, and so that's the the format that they're using for that endpoint. All right, and again, as mentioned, Dolby HD for Blu-ray disc playback. All right, so a little more details on the formats themselves. Um, so the 84 IMS format um, is a perceptual coder. So to answer the lossy versus lossless question, this is a, um, a lossy codec. Um, it is using perceptual modeling to um, pick what data to send and um, discard data that uh, you can't hear because it's being masked in various ways. Um, again, it's optimized for stereo endpoints and that allows us to deliver a uh, you know, very high quality presentation at very low bit rates. So the operating range is all the way down actually to 72 kilobits per second, scaling up to 320 kilobits per second with adaptive bit rate support. Um, a key aspect of this technology is that because of how it works and this partial rendering approach that we use, this is the, the format that can precisely match the output of the binaural render in the Dolby Atmos content creation tools. So this is why this is the format we, you know, we use for delivering the headphone experience to mobile devices, because we've tuned this codec to precisely match the output of the Dolby Atmos renderer. And that includes the application of the binaural render modes that are available in the renderer for each of the objects. Awesome. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to come back to you. I'm going to ask about binaural. You've got a, uh, a couple more to go through, but let's. I'd like to yeah. come back to put a pin in the binaural render mode and where that gets uh, heard and distributed, yes. et cetera. No problem. Very good. Um, as mentioned, this is a single bit stream that enables different playback scenarios. Um, the, uh, you know, what's nice about this is that it saved the player developer and the, um, the streaming service from having to worry about what to do if um, and saves them from having different assets on the server as well. So whether I have headphones in, whether I have stereo speakers active, if I'm in portrait mode, whatever, this same stream can be used, which is a uh, just a simpler integration. Um, and you know, also in includes integrated loudness management. So that allows us to align the loudness of the content to the playback device. Um, so you'll see in most music apps, there is a sort of loudness normalization function that is present and this is actually built into the 84 format so that's part of the technology all right next up dd plus jocks so as mentioned um yeah the full the full technology name is dolby digital plus with joint object coding uh this is a layered technology um again it uses perceptual coding to code the audio and it is based on the Dolby Digital Plus format, which was you know, developed quite a long time ago, but has a very, very broad ecosystem, uh, you know, very broad ecosystem support across um, you know, online delivery, HDMI devices in general. Um, so it's, it's very well you know, accepted and broadly deployed in the ecosystem. So it's meant that, I mean, because this is in literally every single Dolby Atmos decoding device in the world, and there are a lot of those, uh, this has given us a very broad reach for the Dolby Atmos music content you know, very quickly. It's allowed us to scale uh, the devices that we can support very, very quickly without having to do any additional work on deploying new formats. Um, as mentioned, this technology is, it delivers discrete channels and objects to the device for rendering. Um, and that allows us to really to scale to whichever the uh, configuration is that your rendering endpoints have. Uh, uh, we carry um, the typical operating point is 15 full range uh, objects plus the LFE channel. Um, before the DD plus jock uh, encoding process, we run a single ended process that we call spatial coding. What that does is looks across all of the masters, uh, sorry, all the objects and channels in the master and looks for uh, spatial as, uh, sort of similarities, our objects clustered together, as well as relative loudness. And then that allows us to group those objects together spatially into a smaller number so that we can then um, deliver to the consumer. The practicalities of delivering a full 128 objects to the, to the consumer from both a bit rate as well as you know, decoding complexity perspective make that prohibitive. So this is the approach we've taken to simplify and reduce that number down. 
data rate wise, this certainly operates at a higher bit rate than the 84 format. It's, it is based on an older technology with Orbit Digital Plus. That's one of the trade-offs um, to get broad compatibility. We have an older underlying codec, but we can still deliver great quality um, starting at 448K per second. And we recommend a data rate of 768 kilobits per second for this technology. And again, integrated loudness management is, is present there. All right, and a little more on Dolby True HD. Um, this one is a lossless compression technology. So the underlying uh, coding method is lossless. Um, this does allow for the highest uh, sound quality uh, to be delivered. Um, and it's compatible with the Blu-ray disc format as well as HDMI. So again, for delivering Dolby Atmos music on physical media, this technology is fully supported and you know, will work and, and flow through the ecosystem quite effectively. Um, one of the challenges, of course, with lossless audio coding is bit rates, and that's certainly the case with the Dolby 2 HD format. It's about 10 times more than um, the DD Plus Jock format, for example. So, yes, yeah, you are definitely trading off some, uh, some bit rate there to deliver the lossless format, but the option is there and is available. One of the other features of this technology, and again, because this will be on physical media where you don't quite know what the endpoint is going to be, the Bitstream can actually support multiple independent artistic mixes. So if you wish to include, you know, Dolby Atmos and then a separate artistic stereo or even 5.1 mix, then the Bitstream itself can carry all of those uh, simultaneously. Again, you're going to pay for that on bitrate, but the, the format can support, so can support that. And on something like Pure Audio Blu-ray, where you've got no video, that's actually quite feasible. Yeah, I was about to mention the nice thing about the so pure audio as a as an example, having you know three or four different formats on you know full res formats on the disc gives the consumer lots of options to listen to. Um, you yeah, know, exactly. I, you would touch on something real quick. You, you we talked about this before, sort of in the prep, and you you've got to mention here about the six point eight megabits per second for the download. You know, for us, uh, I would say purists or people who want to hear it as close to the artist's intent as always, you know, uh, is uh, hearing the non-compressed audio, you know, and we were talking about sure wish it would be nice if we could stream the true HD, but that's that's really because of bandwidth wise, that's less than 4K video or that's, that's less than other streaming services are doing with video and things. So it's really just a, a commitment, a server size, I suppose, and a bandwidth, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a good summary. I mean, we we've certainly had requests from you know quite a lot of areas of what you know can you stream Dolby Atmos in a in a lossless format, uh, and the answer is technically yes, absolutely we can do that. Um, you know, we've it's not actually that hard to do. We've you know you you put Dolby to HD in an MP4 file on a server, you modify some player software to recognize the formats and then you find a device that supports that format and it works and as you say if you have the internet connection then that's definitely feasible so the challenges there are not really so much on the 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 technical front we know we can do this um, it's just bits you can deliver bits um, the the challenge i think is more the uh maybe on the services side that it's uh, it unfortunately does address a relatively small population in the listening you know in the listening world for music um, because this technology is really for living room playback and, uh, you know, those in the living room who have the systems for which lossless audio would take, you know, could take advantage. And so at the moment, um, I, I don't think we found a service that, that wants to sort of spend the money, you know, because it is moving bits and storing those bits um, for, a, unfortunately, a really relatively small percentage of their, of their consumers. Hope, hopefully growing with uh, sound bars, movies, you know, things like that, people people getting into yeah. it or realizing that the experience on speakers is phenomenal and much, much more impressive than headphones, at least for me. Yeah, um, exactly. You talked about two. So two other things to touch on these 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 three uh, topics here we have real quick. One, um, you know, talking about normalizing or looking at the volume, the level, the metadata. So I want to ask about album versus track and where is this measured uh, would be, you know, one reference back and the next thing would be the let's let's go back to the binaural render mode settings also sure. if we could please all right very good um so with respect to loudest measurements so we have guidelines for mixes of course as to loudest that they should you know preferably mix to uh but the the coding systems themselves um support loudness and metadata within the bitstream and that's measured as part of the encoding process so when you 
you know, trigger whichever encoder it is, then the loudness is measured. Our approach on album loudness um, and indeed on album workflows in general uh, is to um, measure all tracks across the album and find the loudest one and then use that loudness for all of the other tracks. Um, the reason for that is it ensures that playback level is consistent for the album and we're not messing with the mastering between tracks. Um, this also follows guidance from some of the loudness, um, the loudness work that has been done. Uh, who's his name? I can't remember. Anyway, I know there's been papers that have been presented on the preferred approach around album loudness, and that's the that's what we've also Ian chosen Shepard. to follow. Ian uh, yeah. yeah, yes, Ian Shepard. Um, there's someone else who worked with Title on this. Um, I, his name escapes me right now. I apologise for that. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is this is the guidance that that we've seen in the industry being adopted, and it just. From our perspective, it makes sense. We should not be getting in the way of interact loudness. You know, and you can go and do that quite quickly if you're not careful. So yeah, we want but, to consider the loudness of the albums. So you've got two different methods of doing that, though. And, and I guess is there any chance? So it's uh, so this, the playback system. Sorry to hit this, but the the playback mm -hmm. system is uh, uh, dependent on whether it's a, a singles playlist versus an album playlist, for example. So they might toot the same song may be played back differently depending on what's surrounding it. Is that correct? So that's plausible. In the in these bit strings, we actually only carry one value, and it's the album. It's for the album playback because we, you know, we prioritize that in the design. Uh, there are other methods of carrying separate specific track loudness uh, in the usually in the MP4 file format at the layer above. So that's another approach that can be used. Cool. Okay. We'll look forward to to uh, further development there. As a big fan of albums, I want to see uh, you know the artist intent of the album that's a i know that's a big thing for a lot of folks yep, uh, and real quick the binaural render mode setting where those where those get heard how those are uh, integrated used um can you touch those please and, and yeah sure within the different three formats there that you're talking about as well yeah indeed so um the binaural render modes um are set during content creation for each channel and object that's in the in the mix um, those are then exported as part of the master file and are then input to the encoders. Um, at the moment, the only format that we have that will recognize those and process them and deliver them to the consumer is the AC4 IMS format, um, which is again why we you know, really you know, recommend that as the format for stereo headphone endpoints, because that will deliver artistic intent as intended. Um, the the other technologies we have here, because of needing to reduce the number of objects um, in a you know in a sort of perceptual way, and having to maintain compatibility with these format capabilities on you know number of clusters and things like that, we can't support the headphone rendering metadata in those formats and also deliver a high enough quality for both headphone and speaker playback which is why we've used the AC4 format, because that allows us to address the primary headphone playback use case, which is the mobile devices. Got it. Cool, all right, thank you. And um, yeah, and uh, uh, just noticing the time that we're at 30 minutes, I don't want to stop you from your present, your deck. I, thank you for clarifying some of these things along the way. I know there are questions that were probably going to come up, so that was uh, good to hit them while yep. we had them. No, I mean, I think the, this is basically the last the last slide of the prepared material. And it's just, again, just a visual sort of overview and summary of um, the different format capabilities. And to answer the sampling rate question that came up, everything that we do with uh, Dolby Atmos Music is at 48 kilohertz for delivery. Um, in the case of Dolby True HD for the, if you want to do just surround, then you can use higher sampling rates up to 96 kilohertz. But for Dolby Atmos, um, everything is 48 kilohertz. Great. Thanks for that. Um... I think uh, I think at this point maybe it's time to uh, bring Christine back on and see if we want we'll to get some anything else you want to add before we get to Q and A or uh, Mike, are you good? And uh, shall we get to questions? Good. Yep. Hi, Christine. Welcome back. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Um, you guys touched on a lot of the questions while you were talking, of course, Michael. Um, Mike, we're still seeing your presentation. If you can take that. Yep. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I'll just go through them at any rate, but I think Michael was probably glancing at the chat a little bit. He was, or channeling his colleagues very, very well. So let me look and see what he channeled. Um, 
loudness, just because we were right there, Michael, you had the same questions that Justin Gray did, which was amazing. Um, and we also had a couple of questions from others on this topic. So in no particular order from Dave O'Donnell, curious to know more about the Codex loudness management and does that relate to streaming services and device setting options such as Apple Music sound check setting? You were on the hairy edge of that. So yes and no, which gets a little bit complicated, but these, these answers are always a little bit complicated. Otherwise you would probably already know those answers. Um, so in the case of Apple Music and what they're doing in their devices, um, the, um, the loudness management is actually, they do a single-ended loudness management approach in their, own, in their own Apple way and soundtrack. So what they're doing there is decoding audio and then leveling it according to the, uh, whatever's happening um, in the device. Uh, for the AC4 formats uh, and the plus drop on other devices, loudness management is always active and it's not something that's under the device control. So if you see the option in the app, it might affect stereo, but it won't affect the app yeah. coding. Amazing, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, also on the topic of album loudness, if all tracks are delivered as separate ADM with B, uh, B Wave, when would the album loudness be measured? Is it measured at Dolby when you're generating the AC4 IMS slash DD plus jock? Again, remember, I read these verbatim, guys. Um, if so, who is it that informs you that a collection of those songs is an album? And would new loudness measurement then replace the original LUFS reading that was generated with the ADM B Wave Master? Good question. So okay. the so the decision on that is made by whoever's running the encoder. The encoder has an ability, or you inform the encoder to inf to encode a selection of tracks or a collection of tracks as an album. So you provide the tracks in order to the encoder, and it goes through and encodes them in sequence. That's also how we handle uh, gapless playback. So in that case, yeah, it'll be the encoder that is analyzing all of those tracks uh, one by one, and assuming you're giving them, you know, giving it all the tracks, and then it will measure all of them, figure out the loudest one, and then we'll use that as the sort of the anchor loudness for the album loudness uh, parameter. And so that's what you'll actually see in the encoded bitstream that comes out of the encoder. Fantastic. A um, couple of more questions from Justin. First, with AC4 IMS, are you using the binaural lefts level to inform streaming normalization, not the 5.1 render? Yes, we are. Okay, going to get a little bit into bed information. Can you clarify how the bed information is dealt with in the DD plus jock format with spatial coding? Sure. Um, beds are treated by the, the spatial coding format itself. So in a typical encode pass, um, the beds are input to spatial coding and spatial coding treats those as a static object effectively. It's like, okay, I have a channel that's positioned to the left and it has energy at this position. And it includes that in its calculations of how to reduce down to the typically 15 clusters. Um, so yeah, that's how that works. Great. With all these capabilities, good question from Michael Early. Early, I think. Uh, well, with all these capabilities built into the file, how is this affecting file size? Um, so I'm assuming that's referring to the encoded file size, uh, and hopefully the data rates that I showed are, um, you know, that that kind of indicates that even with those relatively low bit rates, we are delivering, you know, all the features that we're talking about in a single file. Um, this is again the, the sort of trade-off between um, you know coding quality versus delivery versus decoding complexity and things like that. And it's something that we're always looking at and and looking to to improve and evolve. Um, but yeah, certainly moving to the AC4 format is giving us some substantial help on the audio coding piece, and that allows us to you know introduce more features into the, into the files with um, actually I would say an improvement in quality in that context. I will get to that question you just put in, Michael. Give me one second. I like that one. Uh, so Barry Rudolph asks, so does DD plus stock, it, um, is that uncompressed and AC4 AMS data compressed? Uh, so you, you, both, of the, both of those formats are compressed formats. I mean, I, I would, um, it's probably worth saying that, I mean, everything we deliver is compressed 
it's the nature of the compression. So in the case of Dolby Digital Plus Jock and AC4 IMS, it's, it is a perceptual coder, so it's lossy compression. It's looking at the, you know, using an advanced perceptual model to figure out what you can hear and what you can't hear, and is then, you know, not delivering the data that the model understands that you can't hear. Uh, Dolby 2 HD is still compressed, but it is a lossless compression. So it's yeah, effectively, you know, zip file for the audio that goes into the encoder. Great. And um, Dolby True HD is still subject to spatial coding, correct? Yeah, that is correct. And the and it, I think that's that's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Um, when you're listening on the in the content creation tools, you're listening through spatial coding, unless you go and disable it, we certainly recommend you listen through it. Um, because that is a single ended perceptual um, cluster reduction process. The output of that um, is then coded using the Dolby True HD lossless codec. Because again, we can't, even, even with a good lossless format, we can't deliver 128 objects to, to the home. Um, you know, we have a format that does that. It's uh, the IAB format. Um, but again, that's, that's not feasible for delivery to a consumer device. The bit rates are just too high. So there are two related questions. One is, um, do the formats handle objects and beds differently? And second is uh, kind of related, is there an average number of objects being used by creators? So fundamentally, no, beds and objects are not handled differently per format. We make sure that the front end of the encoding process handles those in the same way. Under the hood, there's a bunch of things that happen which are different in the coding approach, but the intention is that we are supporting everything in a consistent fashion. Great, and the number, uh, average number of objects being used by creators. I would actually pump that straight back to you because I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've done a survey of that yet and it's all over the place. Uh, so some of the labels actually have. And I can tell you that it's a pretty broad gamut. In one case, uh, I, I am familiar with, uh, with the number of tracks that, where they actually used one. Uh, yeah. And also, you know, six would be, you know, a, a, a spectrum. Another spectrum would be all that the tool will allow, right? So you'll hear 64 and 102 and, and things like that. Um, it's really up to the creator. And it's really what I see is down to the genre and then down to, um, you know, the the fingerprint of the mixer. You know, if I can if I can answer that for the things that I see as well is a, a, absolutely. I get a wide gamut. Sometimes I'll get things in, uh, even within the same album project by the same artist, or I mean by the same mix engineer. That sometimes there may be only a bed and you know four corners for height objects, or it might be a hundred objects and one LFE in the, well, you know, channel in the bed and that's it. And it, it's, um, it's as varietal as it can be. Um, Christine, I also think that you're, you're on it a bit with the uh, genre. Cause I think that some genres people tend to approach differently, not necessarily um, production wise or hearing, you know, uh, but the thought mentality behind how they're mentally putting together the picture of the objects and the beds and the sense of space and all that, I think, it, you know, it, it is somewhat genre related. So I, I think that there's a correlation there. Absolutely. And you obviously see a pretty broad gamut of genres as well. So it's, there is a question specifically for you, Roma, how are the new formats complicating your job? Oh, that's in the question. Okay. Uh, okay. That's in the question. Uh, right. <laughs> you might want to just call Michael and, and get a drink, I think. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, I, I just pulled it up here. Okay. So Michael, uh, Michael Early. Hey man, how you doing? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the the comp uh, the complication for Juan certainly is stereo to multi-channel is understanding, you know, the first thing we have to do is get a concept of what we're hearing, you know, and what the listener is going to be listening to, like developing that sense of opinion about this is what's going on and then figuring out what to do from there. But that's a, you know, somewhat similar process to stereo, only more complicated because there are more channels. There are more possibilities for interactions to go haywire, you know, uh, uh, compression or EQ or those types of things that can throw off imaging levels, you know, stuff like that. Then, then the complication of paying attention to the codex and knowing what they sound like to advise clients. The, the next thing from there is that if there is doing certainly QC and listening to these different formats, so I know what they're hearing. And then honestly, one of the big complications is explaining to the client how to listen to know what's going to happen for the, you know, where the consumers are going to hear their music. So there's um, 
a cascade of complications along the way. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the nice things about the industry is we're figuring this out and these we're finding these pressure points and these barriers to um, straight to the art. You know, like they say, the best amplifier is a straight wire. The best conduit mm -hmm. from the art to the consumer is as straight as possible. And these complications are also informing ways to be more efficient and develop tools that will help get us there faster. I hope that helps, Michael. Yeah, and I think also we're we're learning together with with people like Romo and all of you where we need to lean in on communication so that we can help we can help clarify that um, th these questions are terrific because it it's it's a very um, it's an integral part of, of that learning on our side as well. Um, there, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a paying attention. Yeah, yeah, just Michael, it's a it's a it's a deeper paying attention because there's a lot more to pay attention to as far as the complications that you're asking within this, and it's uh, but also the reward is that much higher when you when you transport somebody into that experience when it's done correctly. Mm. Good. So uh, again, so many good questions. So I'm just going to keep powering through. There is a thank you in here from Justin Gray to you, Mike, um, for all for answering all of those questions. Oh, um, thanks for the good questions. <laughs> IAB get used. Um, so IAB, the immersive audio bitstream, is a. Um, it's you can think of it as sort of an equivalent to the ADM uh, B wave formats, but it, it is uh, a sort of a smaller, you know, file size version of that because it can use lossless compression to code the audio, but it retains all of the objects, beds, metadata, and everything else. Um, it was designed for use um, in AV as part of the IMF format. So, so if you're you know, preparing content and delivering for IMF, then IAB is the immersive audio format that's used there for you know, objects plus beds. Um, yeah, not used for uh, consumer delivery. Is there an advantage to using only objects in LFE and no bed tracks? Uh, in the context of the codex, no, doesn't make any difference. And the conduct of your mix, that's a creative decision, I believe, I think I would say. Yeah, and we see a pretty broad gamut of, um, of that application as well. Again, very much about the way that the mixer works and the nature of the music. And um, some are applying some, I want to say templates, but I want to be conservative about that answer, um, meaning that it may be, you know, the, the base template and then they're doing something, you know, quite creative to Michael's point, song to song. Is that what you're seeing, Michael? Yeah, yeah. And, a, you know, a template, yeah, starting space, but that just means a play, you've got to start from somewhere and then just adapt based on, you know, where the art needs to go or where the where the, the particular song needs to take that, you know, people do have places uh, to start from. But yeah, every song is different and every approach uh, can be different based on, you know, complexity, density of the mix, you know, uh, uh, what they're trying to get across, front end, back end, shiny stuff static listener position, you know, all of those things make all of these decisions, beds, objects, and, and that, you know, sort of on the necessary on the fly. Yeah, that's, that's great. And the nature of these questions, it's good to remind everyone. So Dolby doesn't do any of the encoding. Um, the encoding is done by either in some cases it's a label in some cases it's a service provider but it's not it's not something that we control you don't have to send uh, the work to Dolby to have it encoded um, and I just want to make sure that that piece is really clear because it's, it's in some of this questioning um because that, that aspect of that that's what you're asking me about but yeah yeah missed that part of the questions but yeah no no that wasn't you yeah yeah I just want to make sure that that was clear in some of the thread um Okay, there's a bit more in here. So there is a thread. I'm going to get to some of this for Mike. So if there's if there's time, um, could you briefly describe the difference between a film stream DCP and a Dolby True HD file? Uh, sure. Very high level. Um, yeah, DCP is used for delivery to digital cinemas. It actually uses the uh, something very similar to IAB under the hood. It's um, it's you know effectively IAB format. It's delivering all beds plus objects to the cinema that can be delivered accordingly. No spatial coding involved. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's again a, a sort of almost a master equivalent mezzanine format that allows for highest fidelity playback in the cinema. Um, not intended for consumer delivery. Um, would never fit on a disc or you know you need a very 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 big internet pipe to deliver it. Different use case. Terrific. Um, okay. 
Can you make the mono then pan out to, to Dolby to avoid, uh, excuse me, to avoid phase cancellations? Uh, I would pump that straight back to the uh, to, to Romo, I think, on that one. Yep. Uh, it uh, I would say it depends um, <laughs> because it as as most things do. My favorite oxymoron is all things depend. I suppose so. Uh, but you know, it depends on if you're doing other things. If you're putting uh, delay, reverbs, other processing, and you're doing something on an opposite side, let's say, and then if it gets summed down and you know and in, into stereo or even folded down from something that you're doing, let's say you put a mono object up in the ceiling in the middle and you're going to fold down to the floor at some point. Here, a five one version. If you're doing something wacky with a reverb even though it's a mono object and you've got some delay or reverb or something phasey or something that's happening and it's in a different position in that fold you can create cancellation and you can cause problems so just like good practices summing to mono of a stereo mix to check cancellations you should also do that in immersive work and uh, um, whether objects beds mono stereo however yeah absolutely there's a question here about about where Dolby Atmos is streaming. So I'm just gonna take that one now. Um, it's not normal. It wasn't the immediate focus of this, but I wanna make sure that Carl hears my answer. Um, so yeah, so Dolby Atmos is streaming on Tidal, Amazon Music, um, Apple Music, Ongama, Ongami, Vibe, and Neo Radio. And uh, QQ uh, by Tencent just announced actually. So we're really, really excited about all of those and, um, you know, happy to answer any additional questions about that, but certainly streaming. Okay. Um, how do I do So Mike, this is for you. How does Dolby coding compare to new audio technologies, spatial audio designer, SAP plugin, things like that? I don't know if you want to get into the compare. I'm not familiar with that, so I yeah I don't know. Okay. They're, they're, um, they're they're different different uh, processes, but um, just like spatial audio designer or or spat revolution, or uh, there are a handful of other ways to make objects out of particular tracks, and they do different processing with them. So it's just a it's, it, it, just to briefly answer the question there, it's a different perspective. Great, thank you. Um, so then uh, let's see, a couple more. Speaking of genres, singer, songwriter, Americana, R&B, rock, synth, is there an advantage to using Dolby 3D in any of these versus mono mixed into stereo? Yeah, Romo, I would defer to you on that one. You know, um... I've uh, having heard a ton of stuff across a ton of different genres. I, I just think well done is well done, you know, and I think genre, you know, if, if you're paying attention to the presentation and thinking about the, you know, what is, what are the meaningful aspects of the song and what's the intentional listening perspective of the listener are you putting them on stage with you are you putting them in a you know surrounded beehive are you like what are you trying to accomplish with it but i think genre wise I, i've done things that have been more front and center like you're sitting in the audience and things that are even heavily weighted in the back i think that's the beauty of this is creativity is abound paint the room not the front wall there's a lot of things you can do and i think every genre can benefit from a good mix done done in uh you know in a three-dimensional space it's a really cool point that you're making because some of the most interesting work is coming out of rooms where you can't see any of the speakers mm -hmm. because you're not you're not mapping a sound to a speaker you're mapping a sound to a location in space if you will or an experience in that space um so again just in terms of what we see in the data um if okay I, I, so if i may real quick if i just add one thing to it and the other misconception is the thought that with the objects and moving things around is that you have to have a lot of them for it to be effective as well and you don't um i would say uh props to eric Schilling, who did a mix of horse with no name at one uh, a few years ago that we worked on together and it was only 14 original tracks yet it is super engaging and enveloping and it's so it also doesn't have to be a lot of content to be engaging for the listener yeah that's right. That's right. Um, there's another one here again to thank you for host, for the session. What additional metadata should producers, mixers, artists consider with multi-channel mix project delivery? 
that's another mixed question i guess i would still i would still go back to to romo for his for his guidance on that i mean again from a from a format perspective our goal is to whatever you create we have metadata to support it and we will deliver that for the consumer how you want to use all those parameters in the content creation tools and how you mix is definitely up to you um you know once those parameters are set we have all the metadata to carry that through to the endpoint uh, yeah, and from a, just Michael, I would love to get your thoughts on that too. What I would just add is that um, the richest mixing, such as what you're referring to with Eric, who's an absolute pro and, and has such a, a good feel for Adobe Atmos, yeah. um, is understanding the capabilities. That's, that's the most I'm referring to, right? So as much as you can have so that you can understand what will happen um, based on the decisions that you're making during the mix process, that's really the, the, the answer to how much metadata and what's, what's needed, right? Yeah, um, it, there's a little bit of squirreliness with the internet connection, so I, I missed part of the question, but as far as the metadata goes, sorry about that, I don't know if it's me or where, but the, uh, yeah, as far as the metadata goes, okay, <laughs> as far as, you know, the metadata for certainly, you know, it would be awesome to see an, a, a fan on this side would be that there's album-oriented metadata for loudness, but you know, we also have as a broadcast wave file or as a as a version of that, there's metadata spaces available to my understanding to have even things like UPC and ISRC codes and, you know, things that we're used to in a DDP world, for example, if we could get to a spot where we're, you know, this metadata is now collected as an album and we're delivering a series one album of files as we do with the DDP, you know, again, we're still figuring this out. We're learning workflows. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that's an opportunity for a, a different type of metadata utilization. I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question, but I think that's adds to it. Good. There is um, maybe just one more um, in terms of time that I think is really good. I'm, I, we might be able to squeeze another one or two in if anyone types quickly. Um, so how does Dolby plan for future development? And this is a question around longevity is the complimentary comment. So one thing I think is really important we can say is, and you'll, you'll hear me talking about more of the creation process and whereas Mike's talking more about the, the delivery and the playback. We, we really work closely with all of you. We take your input and factor that directly into everything from the tools development to the experience, the playback. So how we think about the future is very much based on what it is that you all need as well, right? Um, and, and what it means to build scale and how we can do that with integrity, um, ensuring creative intent to the best of our ability. Of course, there, we're, we're one piece in the chain of how that needs to happen but we do our best to partner both with the global creative community and also with the partners. So, so that's one shred of the answer. Um, Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, that, that's a great one. And, I, and we're, we're always looking at the creative process and how that's evolving and you know, new technologies, new techniques coming in. You know, we, you know, recently released, you know, personalized uh, HRTF for headphone mixing. That's, you know, is actually a big change from the creative perspective, but it has a pretty substantial ripple effect on delivery and playback. You know, the, the goal we would like to do is to, you know, if that is available on the consumer side, we need to be able to deliver that same experience. You know, creatives are consumers and vice versa. Um, so yeah, I, we're, we're always, you know, watching, but also really collaborating with creatives on like, what you want to do. And then we will, and we are designing solutions to to address those needs that you know also map to the evolving, you know, device playback space. So yes, we are not sitting still on this one. No, nope, and we are not done. I love that it's a collaborative back and forth because again, that's uh, that, that it is a two way street of communication to really get to you know best results. Love yep. it. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so I'll just take a, the very last comment. I want to make sure we capture. Um, are we mapping uh, ambisonic recordings to Atmos? How are we thinking about mic placement, et cetera, um, and multi-mic recording in Atmos, et cetera? Um, there is actually quite a lot of work going on here. And again, I'll, I'll nod to the, to the community that you all represent as well, which is that certainly we've done a lot of exploration on this front, but also you are all experimenting pretty significantly. Um, we'd be very happy to share the learnings and point you to those that we know have been doing work in this area. So um, I believe between Michael and Maureen and the team, you can you can reach us, and we're certainly happy to to exchange with you directly and and um, and share some of those learnings. 
Um, with that, I think I'll just say thank you very much. These are absolutely terrific questions. I mean, fantastic and, and a strong group. So thanks so much. And thanks, Michael and Mike. Thanks, Maureen. Oh, thank you. Wow, awesome. That was fun. Today. That was just, yeah, um, just a lot to take in. <laughs> so thank you, <laughs> Mike Ward, and for, for sharing all of that. And, and Christine, too. Uh, thanks, Michael Romanowski. Thanks, Christine Thomas. And thanks, everyone who tuned in. Our next episode, number five in the series, is going to focus on metadata, always one of my personal favorite topics, for real. Um, so we'll hope to see you there. And thanks so much for this uh, candid conversation. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining.